The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, <clears throat> and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who do you say that I am? Have you ever wondered how someone might respond if you asked them that question? Who do you say that I am? It might be kind of silly, but sometimes you wonder how people would respond. Like if you were to ask your children, who do you say that I am? What would they say? They'd probably say, you're my mom or dad. They might say your profession. They might name what you do. But they'd probably go on to talk about things like, well, you take me to church on Sunday. Or you read me books at bedtime. You help me with my homework. You coach my basketball team. Those are the kinds of things that your child would name because that's how they know you. That's how you relate to them. Your identity to them comes in relationship. Or if you're a child and you ask your parents, who do you say that I am, what might they say? They might name your name. They gave it to you after all. They might say, if you're in school still, what grade you're in. They might talk about the quirky little things that you do that make them happy or make them angry. They might name your accomplishments. There's a number of ways that your parents would relate to you as a child, built on the relationship that you have created over time. But what if you asked a coworker, who do you say that I am? What would they say? Maybe they'd start with your position or title. Maybe they'd say, oh, you're the one who runs the football pool in the fall. Or you're the great softball player in the department for our, for our uh, company softball league. Would they name that you're a Christian? Would they know that you attend worship? The things that our coworkers would name depend on our relationship, right? So what if you walked up to a stranger and said, who do you say that I am? Things would be different, wouldn't they? Because you don't have that pre-created relationship with that person. And so the answers could be very different depending on where you meet the stranger. If you ask somebody in a homeless shelter where you were serving, their answer would be very different from the person that you met while being a radical fan at an Iowa, Iowa State, or Nebraska football game. The answer that you get if you walk up to someone randomly on the street is going to be very different from someone you meet in a doctor's office. Because their opinion of who you are is going to be made in a split second of meeting you. You see, who do people say that we are is about our identity, but our identity is built in relationships. Primarily our relationship between us and God, but ultimately in our day-to-day -day lives, it's the relationship we build among one another based on the relationship between us and God. And I think that's something of what's going on in today's gospel reading. I think what Jesus is talking to his disciples is about is he wants to know what's getting through to them. 
At this point, the disciples have been following him for quite a while, probably a couple of years. It's harder to tell in Matthew than in some of the other Gospels. But they've seen Jesus be and do about a lot. They've seen him preach and teach in the synagogue and outside of it. They've seen him go to some pretty crazy places to teach as well. They've seen Jesus heal the sick, cast out demons, feed people thousands and thousands at a time. They've seen him calm storms and walk to them on water. They've had to press through crowds with him, and they've found times to get away and pray. They spent a lot of time, day in and day out, with Jesus, and Jesus wants to know, how do they understand what's going on? So as they approach Caesarea Philippi, they find a little bit of time to get away and to process some of what they've been experiencing, and Jesus starts a little smaller. He says, well, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And the disciples think for a minute, well, what have they been hearing as they've been going around? Well, they say, they say, some say that he's John the Baptist and others, Elijah and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And all of that makes sense if you think about the crowds. The crowds have experienced Jesus teaching and healing, casting out demons. They've experienced some of the scribes and the Pharisees rebuking Jesus, but none of those people in the crowd have seen it all because they've only been there for this episode or that episode here and there. And so when they hear Jesus preach and teach, it reminds them of John the Baptist, especially when Jesus is in strange locations. And when they see him healing and casting out demons and feeding people and reminding people of the love that God has for them and the love that they're supposed to show to one another, especially those who are oppressed. It reminds them of Elijah and Jeremiah and the other prophets. And so Jesus falls in line with all of God's great prophets of the past. But then Jesus turns up the heat a bit. But who do you say that I am, Jesus asks. Who do you this ragtag band of guys who's been following me day in and day out for all these years and seen all of these episodes unfold, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, who rarely thinks before he speaks, jumps up and says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Well, who knew? Something had actually gotten through to him. Something had actually made it past his head and into his heart, and he had a confession ready to go. And Jesus congratulates him on that confession. Simon Peter, you're correct, he says. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail over it. Peter got it right for now. Because we know that Peter's confession isn't whole, Peter's confession isn't full because just a few verses later, which we will read in next week's gospel, Jesus starts to tell the disciples just what it means for him to be the Messiah, that he's going to have to be handed over to the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and he's going to be put to death and will be raised again. And Simon Peter, again without thinking, cries out, God forbid it! And Jesus rebukes him. You see, Peter had the words on his lips, but he didn't know what it meant for him, for his daily life, what it meant for his relationship with Jesus in the days to come. And I think it might be the same for us. At least it's the same for me. I come to worship on Sundays, and I confess in song and in word, in creeds and in prayer, that Jesus is the Messiah. And I believe that in the bottom of my heart, but I fear that even as a pastor in my day-to-day life, the way that I act in relationship with other people, the way that I use my checkbook, the way that I use my time and energy might display to people more of what the crowds believed than what Peter confessed. It might seem to people out there that Jesus was a great guy, that Jesus is someone we should 
emulate, that Jesus came to inspire us to do better. But is that really all the Messiah is about? And I think part of the issue is that the concept of God and what God has done for us in Jesus is so big and so hard for us to get our arms around that the church has done a really good job of coming up with names and titles and formulas and creeds to help us to explain what God is, who Jesus is, how this all works. But I wonder how much of that penetrates, how much of it gets to our hearts, how much of it means, makes a difference in our lives day to day. And so I'm going to ask you a question today. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? What does it mean to you that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of the living God, that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, if we speak theologically, that Jesus, as we say in the Nicene Creed, is God from God, light from light, true God from true God? What does that mean for you this morning in this place? And what is it going to mean for you this week? I spent a lot of time this week pondering that question. I asked myself, if someone were to come up to me, a child, someone in the neighborhood, a friend from high school that I'm on Facebook with, what if one of them came to me and asked me, who is this Jesus? I hear about him, but I've never experienced Jesus. Who is Jesus? What is Jesus for you? How would I respond? Because to tell them that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity or God from God, light from light, true God from true God, isn't going to make a difference in their life. At least not right now. And it may seem like a strange question to ask, but my friends, there are fewer and fewer people in this world that know who Jesus is. And there are more and more people seeking Jesus out because they need the hope that Jesus gives. And so as I pondered this week what it means for me to say that <clears throat> Jesus is the Messiah. This is the confession I came up with. I'm going to share it with you to help spur some thoughts of your own, and I know this confession isn't complete. There are things that are going to be missing. There's things that are important to me that may not be important to you, and things that are terribly important to you in your relationship with Jesus that I'm not going to name. But here's my confession, at least for today. So who do I say that Jesus is? I say that Jesus is God's way of showing us just how much God loves us, how much God loves you and loves me and loves all people for that matter. Jesus is how God showed us that God still loves this creation that he made and all that is in it in ways that we cannot fully understand. Because it's hard for us to be in conversation with God when God knew no other way. God became human and came as Jesus into the world to show us in tangible, physical ways what God's love looks like. And to teach us how to love one another with that same love. I say that Jesus came to show us that no matter what, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I say that Jesus came to show us God's heart, a heart that aches for anyone who is in need. A heart that grieves for people who suffer from depression and contemplate taking their own lives. A heart that breaks and mourns at the death of a young black man, any young black man, for any reason, and for violence that tears a community apart. A heart that is torn to pieces due to violence and warfare that tears apart a city that we call holy. A heart that is heavy 
when children are separated from their parents in search of a better life, to get out of the shadows of drug dealing and certain death. A heart that is so full of love for all of God's people, for all of the people that God has created, that even when I break God's heart, God has grace enough to open his arms wider than I can imagine and to forgive me and to welcome me home. And he does the same for all of you. And I believe that Jesus is all of that, but I think Jesus is more because I think Jesus came to show us possibilities. Jesus came to show us what the world could be. He didn't give people over to the defeat of illness, but he healed them. Jesus did not leave people to be possessed by demons, but he cast them out. Jesus didn't leave people to starve because there wasn't enough food, but he took what there was and broke it and gave it. Jesus didn't allow the religious leaders to tell him who was outcast and to push them aside, but he went and sat with them and welcomed them in to God's family. Jesus wasn't content to leave this world the way that it is, but Jesus wanted to show us what the possibilities for this world are when we start to help God bring the kingdom even onto this side of eternity. Because if Jesus' life and death is about showing us how much God loves us, then Jesus' resurrection is showing us that that same love is stronger than fear and hate and death. In short, Jesus shows us that God wins. God always wins. And so there's my confession. And no, it's not perfect. And yes, it's colored by what's going on in the world today. And I think that's okay because it helps me to connect my faith to what's going on in the craziness and chaos that I need to make sense of. And if I can't name who Jesus is for me in that world, then how am I going to find hope on a day-to-day -day basis to go on? Because there are people out there who are hurting, who are being oppressed either by things that they've done to themselves or by powers that they have no control over, and they need to be free. And there are powers out there that are causing pain and hurt and destruction in this world that need to be called out and named and have something done about them so that they can be put aside, so that more people can live in the fullness of the world that God has wanted us to live in. And that's what I think Jesus is getting at when he says to Peter, I give you the king keys to the kingdom of heaven. The, those things which you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and those things which you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus wants us to be about freeing people from those things that bind them, loosing them and letting them go, and calling out those things that bind us up in this life. And working together, and my gosh, that seems like a big job for any one person to do, and it is, and that's why Jesus calls the church to that action. Because as Paul writes in Romans, we have all been gifted in different ways, and when we put those gifts together, we become more holy, the body of Christ, and we can more powerfully deal with the issues in this world that are holding us back, that are dealing death and fear and destruction. And so I ask you again, who do you say that Jesus is? Think about it this week. Think about how your confession of who Jesus is can shape your life. And if you're willing, go out to the blog at RedeemerIndianola.org and find the question for this week, which is not out there yet, but will be this afternoon. Who do you say that Jesus is? Write a sentence, write two, it doesn't have to be as long as mine. But who is Jesus for you? Who do you say that Jesus is? Because we all have different experiences, right? Our experience, how we, what we say about who Jesus is, is built on our relationship with him. And if we start to share our relationships, we get a fuller picture of who Jesus is. 
we get a better understanding of who Jesus is in this world and how Jesus is working. And that's where we're going to find hope, my friends. When we can see how Jesus is working in different corners, even of this congregation, we find ways, a more fuller, a fuller picture of who Jesus is for everyone. Because ultimately, we need to know that Jesus loves us more than anything in the world, that nothing can separate us from Jesus' love. And that's the message that this world needs more than anything. So how are we going to tell them? Amen.